You guys look great. <laughs> it's book TV. <laughs> so my name is Elaine Walker, and thank you guys for coming. I've only done a reading once before, and that was at my house, totally casual. So this is exciting for me. The book I'm writing is uh, got a working title called Chaos, Consciousness, Curiosity. Like if you plant a seed and water it and then stand back, things happen. It grows, it bifurcates, and it develops into something in a, that looks rather complicated. The tree is actually a very, very complicated shape. It's not a linear shape in any way. It's totally non-linear. Um, and we look at it, and it looks beautiful, it looks natural, but, but it's, it's not anything like anything we build. So, okay, so here's the thing, and before I get into this, I'm just going to summarize the whole point of the book. Everything in the universe appears to be chaotic in nature, and you know fractals and chaos theory are very interrelated. So everything is like that tree. The whole universe just kind of bloomed into existence from like a simple seed. So however that happened. Um, and a lot of it in the macro world can be easily explained with just basic physics and botanists understand how plants grow. So a lot of, when we actually study it, it makes sense. And that more and more we're finding that things can be related to chaos theory, nonlinear dynamical systems. So all of nature is like that, right? Except people. So in one sense, people are just as natural as any other animal, right? No, we're just animals. But there's something weird about us. We don't build trees. We don't think non-linearly. Um, we build squares. And, uh, squares and circles and totally linear geometric shapes. And we tend to box things. A lot of people will, might think morality is just totally natural, something that morphs and changes over time depending on the society. But then you have, you know, very religious people tend to box it up geometrical shapes. And on the other hand of the spectrum, we have people who believe that, um, you know, the very people that believe that morality should be left alone and be natural to grow and do its thing, want to box up the economy. We need to put this, you know, these laws over here and these laws over here and regulations over here and box it up the same way. So I'll never understand the disconnect there. Like, I never... I'm not registered as any party because I can't understand either side. <laughs> so for me, it just seems like freedom is the way to go. Let everything just be free. No law. And maybe I'm an anarchist. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but the reason I don't call myself an anarchist is because there is this weird thing about people. We really do have to think abstractly, geometrically. We have to. I don't know if it's because we became totally self-aware or if it's a result of that, or if that's what caused us to become self-aware. I'm not sure it's a chicken and egg problem. And it somehow goes hand in hand with the fact that we're totally self-aware. Okay, so think of uh, any animal. Think of a, a, my cat, for instance. She's, she's aware of herself. When she looks her paws, she knows that's her. But she's not aware that she's aware that she's aware. We're the only animals that are aware that we're aware that we're aware that we're aware. We're like a total focused feedback loop. So somehow, um, when that happened, when we suddenly became completely focused, we're thinking abstractly. We're building squares and circles all of a sudden. We're boxing things up. It's just a part of being human. Whether it's good or bad, that's really in a way, it's good, but I think once we become more advanced, we'll kind of realize, okay, that's really the only thing that's messing us up. We need to somehow get to the next level where we can think non-linearly. It could be a thousand years before we can really think that way. But does that any questions about that? Because that's really the premise of my book. It's like, yeah, I'd be an anarchist, except, you know, I really actually feel a little forgiving about that. I really do understand why people tend to box things up. So it's going to, for sure, be some degree of that. There's no way we're just going to be anarchists, like everything's going to work out. <laughs> you talk Although, about like boxes and circles, you know, but that's a way like an abstraction of the world, right? Uh -huh. Because it simplifies the world and allows us to, you know, to interact with the world and build wheels and cars with wheels, you know? 
Yeah. Just seemed there, right? It's really hard to imagine. How would we have a car shaped like a fractal? Well, maybe we will when we get anti-gravity <laughs> or we can beam up. Yeah. Maybe that's way maybe in the future. Maybe at this stage, we are... It's hard to imagine a, a tree-shaped right you know, chair. Yeah. We need flat surfaces. We need flat yeah. floors. Well, maybe when we're floating around the space and maybe when we... A little more evolved. Yeah, maybe. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's the thing. So you need to be kind of forgiving to people. Like, all right, it's just a natural tendency that we to, to box things up and do that. Okay, so the chapter I'm going to read from is tentatively called Consciousness. It might split into this whole separate if it gets too long. Um, my chapters tend to bifurcate, just like everything else. It gets too long and then I split it into two. Uh, so there's a whole chunk of this chapter I'm not going to read where I explain what I think consciousness is, um, which I kind of covered a little just now. And then it's going to get into free will versus determinism and all that jazz that you guys came here to see. So just to briefly go over what I think consciousness is or why we're self-aware is there's a book called, I'm going to write it down because everyone needs to read this. If you're interested in my book, you should read this first. Kind of a strange loop by Douglas Hofstetter. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. He, I had kind of already thought about this idea, but he really found a good analogy, and when I read the first half of his book, I was like, yes, that's it. So everything in the universe is just one giant system. Everything overlaps. You know, there's a, humans aren't separate systems. We drink water. The water becomes us, and then it becomes not us. And we interact with each other. Talking to, talking to Bernadette remaps my neurons. You know, we totally overlap. Um, so why are we conscious? What's that all about? Well, there's certain things in the universe that become so incredibly focused, like a black hole, for instance. A black hole in the universe is not a separate system. It still interacts. Its event horizon still interacts with things outside of it. It still spits stuff out, sucks things in. It's interacting, but there, it's definitely it's got something special about it. A black hole, once you're in there, there's no coming out. It's impossible to come back out. So, um, and that's an analogy to our brains. So our somehow, um, he talks about feedback loops constantly. Like growing a tree is a feedback loop. Put a seed in, a little program starts. A simple little program feeds back on itself, grows a tree. So everything's like that. Our brains are somehow organized in an unfathomably complex way. It's all feedback loops. So for some reason, it's become so focused our feedback loop is so focused that we're like a black hole. That's why like, my sense of self is totally separate from any of yours. There's no way my sense of self can leap out of my body and go into your head. It's obviously impossible. And, and um, <clears throat> he describes it, the analogy he uses that I think is brilliant is camera feedback. So if you have so my kitty Baloney, she knows her paw, she knows that's her. She, she doesn't, she's not aware that she's aware. She doesn't think abstractly. For instance, she knows the yard is her territory, but not because it's a rectangle. She knows the yard is her territory because of some natural sense of smell and other complicated, nonlinear thinking. She's not like, that rectangle is my territory, stay out. She doesn't think like that. Because my kitty Baloney's feedback loop her camera is pointing at the TV, but only the corner of it. Has anyone here played with camera feedback? I did in the early 90s. <laughs> and uh, if you point a camera at the screen, and that image um, gets you know fed back like into a mirrors, loop, like you end up with a hallway like a hall of mirrors. Mm -hmm. If it's pointed at the corner, the hallway will go off and end into a turning, and you won't see the end of the hallway. It curves away. That's my cat. Um, cockroach, it's not even pointing anywhere. It's pointing over there. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Humans are weird. We're pointed directly. Our hallway goes straight down to eternity. And if you've ever played with camera feedback, you know something also weird happens. Once it's totally focused, and you can tilt the camera so it will turn more each time, it locks in. There's this thing called locking in. You'd know if you saw it. 
and it becomes a picture. So it actually almost looks like a galaxy or something weird. And uh, depending on if you have something in the image, whatever, something will happen, but it locks into a picture and you're just like, that's no longer really a hall of mirrors. That's a new, that's an entity. <laughs> that's something I'm created this picture just with a simple feedback loop. That's our brains. That's our sense of self. So since we're, even though we're not separate systems, our brains are like black holes. And that's something to do with consciousness. And when that happens, we think abstractly. It's like that picture that happens suddenly is our abstract thinking. Could be a loose analogy, but I think it's worth thinking about. Okay, so with that, I'll